wise up. <laughs> yeah, allergic to lead. <laughs> <laughs> I like people like me. <laughs> we used to be liked. <laughs> Well, it goes in cycles for you guys. It's like yeah, everybody loves you for, for like two weeks and then they hate you for 50 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Royals. Yeah. <laughs> who, Speaking of. I forget of. who we were talking to and they were saying the only way to bring it back was, and they don't want to, nobody wants to see it, but have another tragedy. That's yes. Kind of, that's kind of what cycles yeah. it. I don't remember who said that. If that was, I don't remember yeah, because it was like nine eleven. Yeah. And, it, and it, then it That's changed. when I started right after nine yeah. eleven. Yeah. And everybody loved you know, the fire department even more. And then the cops were mm-hmm. right there. It also helped our budgets. And I'm, I'm not thinking about money, but you able to right. buy the tools you needed mm-hmm. and get the staffing you needed to actually be effective. Right. So, yeah. Well, unfortunately that's kind of how our society is. It cycles that way. And it's, Oh, we hate you until we need you. And then, Oh, we love you. And yeah. yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're a tax burden. Fire yeah. I mean, necessary evil. That's well, I and I think and look at the city and the trash system. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, welcome to the Washdown Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Green, and today my co-host, Chris Nelson, is actually being producer. I'm Jim Moran today. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to complain about not being on camera too? Not yet. No. Okay. But I'm going to ask really long-winded questions. And I'm going to lean, let my arm hang down and touch the floor. <laughs> I might take my shirt off. I don't know. It's very exciting back here. I don't know what's going to happen. Please, please don't take the shirt off. Yeah. I've been working out. I did like no. three push-ups earlier. No donuts. That's yeah. a win in my book. Uh, <laughs> Just because I was on my knees when I did it doesn't mean Yeah, nothing, getting right? out of bed doesn't count. That's, that's where you're wrong. So I told her the story about your uh, Under Armour fiasco at Alamar. <laughs> sausage. Yeah. It's an addictive <laughs> sausage. It was. <laughs> Look like some like bratwurst put together. <laughs> I don't think this one fits, guys. Look like Chris Farley. <laughs> it's oh an God. upper Spanx. <laughs> oh, it was so terrible. I had to help get, him, get it off. He's got his arm <laughs> tip like that. I couldn't, I couldn't move my arm. I was like, I can't get my arm up. Hang out a minute. I couldn't. Like, hey guys, my nose is just. Can somebody get that for me? Oh god. Oh, pretty sure I was. I was thinking that too. Why there is that video of that? You know that, that was that was right about the time we saw flip phones, but they start putting cameras on them. Yeah. So yeah. just before. It was just before Great that would have been an yet. awesome TikTok video. <laughs> <laughs> and a great commercial for Weight Watchers. <laughs> wow, now I know why Moran's so angry back here all the time. Oh, God. You guys are dicks. <laughs> that shit's funny, though. <laughs> Oh, and to bring it back, uh, we have guests today. Rob Sanderson with Swell is here with us today. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you? You know, hanging in there. I'm swollen. <laughs> swollen? <laughs> <laughs> See, I can make fat jokes too. <laughs> and Dana's back. Uh, thanks for having me back. <laughs> thanks for coming back. It's always a good time. Good luck today, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Watch your P's and Q's. Um, yeah, hopefully I won't have to edit this episode like I did the last time you were How on. did Jeremy tell you that story, by the way, about the editing? Did you get the PG version? Well, we didn't. We hadn't had a chance to talk about it, but I knew you guys were going to have to edit. I'm surprised she didn't cut it into two, two episodes. Nah. And really, whenever I went back and watched it, there wasn't a good point to stop it and do yeah. that. It was kind of one of those things where it just... It's better in its entirety than yeah. to try to break it up like that. Well, he did a great job splicing it. Was, it. it was a it was constant really complaining he's been doing ever since. Oh, I can only imagine. Every day, yeah. I have to hear about it. <laughs> well, it's not every day. Like every other day. No, it's every day. Eh, whatever. About the editing uh, of mine? Yeah. Why? Because it was so hard. It was, 
I couldn't oh, do yeah. this and it kept failing. Yeah. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Like, shut well, up. Well, whatever he did do, it was fantastic between. Oh, I mean, he did a good job. It's, we got it right. It was very seamless. But it's the complaining that I just gave the, the phone to the dog the other day. He's like, here, man. You can't hear anyway. <laughs> it's, he doesn't realize I do that every time he calls. I actually have an app on my phone that just every like five seconds it says, uh huh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Easy button. I, yep. made, I made that app because of him. <laughs> <laughs> All now right. we know what the fire department does on your daily <laughs> daily basis. Hey, millions of dollars in that app. Yes, so. I can only imagine. So, Rob, let's start with you and start at the beginning. All right. <laughs> so, you, so when I was podcast. in third grade, <laughs> <laughs> how many hours we got? <laughs> well, our next one is until noon, okay, so perfect. we're good. Um, so, yeah, let's start with, you know, you were a police officer for 18 Police years. officer, 18 years, yeah. Started okay. down in uh, Harrison County, Mississippi, Gulfport, God's yeah. Country, oyster, jumbo shrimp, crawfish. Did you guys know each other? Now I'm hungry. Uh, yeah, there's like, the... there's like seven people <laughs> yeah. between those two counties. So. Yeah, yeah. You never heard that about Jeremy in high school? Great. There was four people in the high school, and he was unpopular. <laughs> <laughs> and graduated fifth somehow. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. yep. Wow. Nice for Rob to come in and finish that. Yeah, I'm off. sorry. Yeah. I got a figure. Varsity move. I, I approve. Uh, but yeah, so cop down there. Um, Hurricane Katrina hit in 2005, and they sent several first responders down there to give us a hand. Uh, I was fortunate enough to meet a contingent of Kansas City cops, uh, kind of from all over the metro, and Lenexa Police Department was one of them. Um, and nine months after the storm, got a job up here and uh, worked for 15 years. Cool. So what got you into, you know, what made you want to be a police officer? Originally, I was going to be in the, the military. I went through Marine Corps officer candidate school. Uh, didn't finish. Got hurt with like four days to go. And that's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And I uh, got a lot of respect for the Marines out there and the stuff that they put them through. Um so in between summers, the, the deal with officer candidate school is you don't recycle. So you just got to start all over the next year. Mm-hmm. Uh, in between that summer, I did a ride along with a buddy of mine. that was a cop in uh, Corpus Christi, Texas, where I went to college. And it was right after 9-11. And we were driving fast, chasing bad guys. And he had a gun. And I said, you know what? I could probably do this. Yeah. So that was, that was my answer. Um, you know, right after 9-11, I remember my dad calling me. And I was a... Uh, junior in college and he says what are you going to do about this I'm like, what do you mean what do we do about it and that that kind of resonated for me um you know leading up to my decision making to try to get into the marine corps or, or do something to serve and you know my answer was to become a cop on that note do you remember where you were when 9-11 hit yep i was downtown in an office building working in a mutual fund company i was actually on the phone with our mutual fund company that is in New York. Yeah. Well, they're in New Jersey, but right across the river. And I was talking to them and the person I was talking to went, Oh crap. And the phone went dead. Right. So do you remember? Yeah. I was sitting at home. I was working at a city bank at the time. I was just out of high school and watched it all unfold on the news, live TV. I forget how much younger you are. So I had just gotten off of work. I was trying to sleep, sent my daughter off to daycare and was watching the news, and it was like, what the heck? It wasn't making any sense, being tired after 10 and a half hours of work anyways. So I went to bed, woke up with an all call. Get your gear, get your shit, let's go. Meet up. And it was like, that night, it was tense. It was really tense the night after. Mm-hmm. Just We had the uncertainty. I mean, well, everybody was accusing everybody, right? Yeah. Um, we had a couple of people that... And we ran calls, and a couple of people were making snide comments, and it it didn't go over well. It's like, that's not funny. Millions no. of people have died. So, yeah. It's interesting how that yeah. kind of stuff changes your life. Well, yeah. And it changed the country. Mm-hmm. I mean, in a big way. I mean, you saw a huge shift. I mean, the patriotism and... I, I, mean, hate, I mean, I hated 9-11, don't get me wrong, but... What I saw afterwards, I loved. Everybody coming together. It's America. Yeah. It's a, it's the essence of America. It's, you know, kind of like cops and firefighters. We make fun of each other. We give each other a hard time, but. Only I can make fun of you guys. 
Yeah. Nobody else can make fun of you. <laughs> if somebody else, it's like you're, you know, yeah, like your siblings. Yeah. yeah, he's ugly, but only I get to tell him how ugly he is. Yeah. If you do it, then no it, it's on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. I, but it was just the the way the country was was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. There's no more Republicans, Democrats. No, it didn't matter what party you were. It didn't matter. It yeah. was not even part of it. Um, the downside to that was um, the discrimination that came towards um, Arabic people yeah. or people of um, Eastern Europe descent. Um, that was horrible for them. And it was. It, hopefully we have long past gotten that resolved. But yeah. good segue, Rob. <laughs> good job. Thank you. Glad I could pull your string. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yet, I mean, to kind of continue along that line, I think I talked about it before um, Rachel had me listening to this book, and I can't remember who the author is, but it talks about tribalism, basically. And that's basically what the country turned into was we were finally cohesive and a big tribe. And that's one mission. Yeah, one mission. And that's kind of. You know, when you think about police department, fire department, you know, EMS services, military, things like that, that's kind of what those are, you know, because you have one mission, you know, you're serving the public, you're, yep. you know, protecting whatever it is, you have that cohesiveness, or at least you're supposed to. Right. One response. Yeah. Everybody plays well. Yeah. Swell. Yeah. Yeah. So how did that get started? <clears throat> so and tell us what it is. Swell stands for Surfways Enjoy Life. Uh, it's a nonprofit that I help found, and I'm the director of. Um, and quite simply, we take our heroes surfing. Um, it's kind of interesting being on the middle of America and, and having a surf organization, but it's so crazy it just kind of works. Um, grew up on the coast, lived in Florida, Hawaii, California, Virginia, Texas, Alabama, Mississippi, and Kansas City. So I uh, really cut my teeth. Okay, I've said that a, a few there's times. A, there's a test at the yeah, end of right. this. <laughs> yeah, check all the boxes of the place where Rob I'm pretty sure he's just singing the Johnny Cash song. <laughs> I've been everywhere, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's yeah. all I heard. <laughs> You're not kidding. So I, I've always I mean, been a water baby. And, right off. Sorry. Yeah, no, I've said it so many times. Um, you know, when you growing up, I went to like nine different schools. The longest I've ever lived in a house is five years. Uh, if I live any place longer than five years, I don't know. It'll probably be a cemetery, I would assume. Uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so you got to go. So anyway, uh, long story short, I kind of cut my teeth surfing when I was in college in Corpus Christi. I started college when I was 17. I really got into it then. Um, after I moved up to Kansas City, I would continually make these surf trips. And I didn't really recognize why I was doing that, kind of how we discussed, you know, slow learner. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but then, you know... <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Insert insult. <laughs> I'll let it stew okay. for a bit and wait. Thank you. Yeah. There'll be more jokes on me here shortly, I guarantee you. So anyway, I, uh, you know, what I say is the only thing worse than not being able to go surfing is being able to go surfing but not having anybody to go with. So I started teaching my buddies from Kansas City how to, how to surf, took a few guys out there, and, um, you know, I, I could see kind of the, the result of them being in the water, not having their radio, not having their gun, not having their family on shore, like yelling for them and just kind of being present and real true active mindfulness and then focusing on a new task. So a real exercise in increasing their self-efficacy or their ability to accomplish something and then the elation that they got from catching their first wave. So after seeing that a few times, um, uh, I had a buddy that was involved in a shooting and, you know, it was one of these deals where he was driven at, uh, the uh, driver was a minority male. He's a white male. Um, you know, they investigated it for two months, and he was off work the whole time, and he came back, and he just he looked like hammered dog squeezers. So he uh, gained some weight, didn't look awesome, could tell he was stressed. And I, and I just said, hey, man, what if I just took you surfing? I just paid for it. Like, I'll pay out of pocket. We'll just figure out, let's just go surfing. And he's like, yeah, yeah. It ended up not going down, but that kind of sparked my interest. And then um, hanging out with the guys from War Horses for Veterans, um, kind of saw what a nonprofit could do for first responders and veterans and um, put some heads together and we formed Swell and we've been taking uh, trips out to California ever since. So is that what, <clears throat> that situation there, is that what started your kind of path down the mental health thing or realizing that it was something that that population, our population needs? 
Yeah, so I, I've helped found, as a corporal, our uh, peer support unit at the police department. And I've had some training in uh, critical instance stress management and then, you know, a lot with the peer support stuff. So I was already kind of in tune with that. Um, you know, after uh, Katrina, I had some issues, some cumulative stress, a few acute traumas. So I had to work through that. And um, so I was aware that that stuff is present um, as much as I act like it didn't bother me. I, I had some some things going on as well. So um, for me, it was just, you know, seeing War Horses being a, a great example of a great program and then taking guys out on these surf trips and seeing what it did for them. I was like, I mean, I, I don't know. Originally, I thought I would just load guys up in vans and drive them down to Corpus Christi because <laughs> I will. I'll Hippie drive days. for 14 and a yeah. half hours straight and no problem. Um, mm. But it caught on so well that we're, you know, we're making trips to, to Huntington Beach. Instead. You mentioned uh, peer support group. So um, that is one of the things that I think a lot of agencies are trying to get going or have gotten going. And either it's fizzled out, it's poorly run, not enough money, not enough people. What was it that was successful about your peer support group for the department that you worked for? I think that it, they allowed a corporal, which is like the first level of supervision to actually run it and not a sergeant, not a captain, not a major. And I think a lot of departments go, this is going to be a big deal. We better put a major in charge of it. And nobody yeah. wants to go talk to a major ding dong about how they're feeling. But if you can have a corporal that's like in touch with this stuff mm -hmm. and sees it and then has a group of, you know, master police officers or police officers that are on the ground level, like, that trust that corporal and like, Hey, you need to go check on, um, you know, Joe or whatever. And then just having those conversations and, and having somebody that's respected, uh, has the credibility to, to, you know, make an impact and people would trust to open up to them. That's what makes the peer support successful. Not because major ding dong said so. Well, yeah. And that's the point of it's peer support. Right. So if you have someone, a supervisor, that's not a peer, right. You know, and, and Major and Ding Dong has got really good intentions, so I don't mean to insult right. her. Right, yeah. no, her. absolutely yeah. not. But at the same time, it's somebody that's assigned to a unit, right? Yeah. So um, I wanna, it, I'm going to open up to somebody that I know their intention is to be in that position because they want to help. They have true intentions, not this is where I'm at for right now until I can make deputy chief. Or, And I think your corporal is our sergeant position. Right. So uh, it's no, officer they're, and then corporal. <clears throat> no, so it's officer, MPO, corporal, sergeant. So they're an, an intermediate. Okay, so gotcha. if a sergeant is absent, then yeah, they can the run MPO the shift. Oh, gotcha. So in smaller departments like where I came from, um, you know, to take a day off, you either needed a sergeant to cover you or uh, a corporal to be there because there was only you know one or two sergeants on a time. Yeah. Okay. Kind of a stepping stone. Yeah. Or stepchild. Well, we have we <laughs> had MPOs, but. Um, it, it didn't really become fruitful. It was just more of a way to get a little bit extra money. Yeah, that's basically, yeah. So. Yeah. Well, yeah, and to bring it back with the whole peer support thing, as far as being a peer, you know, like you said, the major is well-intentioned. But at the same thing, at the same time, you want somebody that you can relate to. Yeah. You know? And, right. I mean, and that's not attached – yeah, I won't get into. Well, you don't issues, want to but. feel like if I talk to someone of command, um, that whatever I say could get me in trouble, right? right. So th I think that's the biggest fear that a lot of law enforcement has is how is this going to impact my job? Mm -hmm. Is this going to mean that I can't do my job? Are they going to find out and then they take my gun and now I can't run calls or I can't take the detective's test or I can't do this, I can't do that, or it's going to hit me in court? I think that's a major impact on a lot of officers' minds. Oh, yeah. Um, and I think that's what's holding a lot of them back from saying anything other than the the machoism. And that, I mean that for both men and women. Yeah. Because I didn't need help. I'm not, you know, walking around with a torn Women shoulder. in law enforcement are far more macho than the men. I guarantee you that. Agreed. Yeah. Well, we kind of well, had kinda to had, be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know. I'm scared of most of them. That's, that's, that's a positive. Present company excluded. But. Oh, oh. oh, that's going to get you in trouble later. Yeah, I, know. I told you I'm not going to walk out of this room without getting smacked once. <laughs> <laughs> I, I won't yard. smack. Him. That's right. You beat him down, neighbor's yard. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but there's a lake right over there. There is. <laughs> the you bubble know. stops him. Somebody come get <laughs> At me. At some point. <laughs> it's it's a common problem though with police and fire is that macho type A 
you know, personality bullshit that I'm, I don't, I'm good. I don't need any help. You know, a, I'm the one that helps people. Yeah. We're not going to be weak. Yeah. But yet we have programs of, you know, fit for duty and all of that stuff for physical fitness, which obviously everyone takes advantage of. <laughs> But I don't think you looked your way. Yeah. They don't pay me to work out. <laughs> they used to pay. You us know what's to work funny out. is they yeah, don't pay to awesome. eat either. <laughs> <laughs> she's not wrong. Oh, we, she's I mean that's yes. we, don't, we don't get lunch breaks. We don't either. Bullshit. No, now we can take an e call. Is that an e <laughs> call? Is an eat call literally? Um, but because we're running. Blacked out, you literally have to tag it at the beginning or end of a call. Can we and have a, can we have a quick PSA? Like, yeah. Is that okay? Sure. Let's stop using the word literally if it doesn't need to be used. It's oh, literally driving trigger. him mad. It's- <laughs> <laughs> Let's use Wound. emphatically, open. metaphorically. Wound open. Wound open now. Okay, we I'm know sorry. What, what's going to get For sure. Um, I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Where were we going with that, though, too? The um, fact that they don't pay him to eat. They don't pay you to eat, and they don't pay you to work out. But um, there was some something else we were going to go for. On it's totally one. derailed you. I apologize. Yeah. yeah. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> It'll come back to you. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get there. How long before he throws his hands up? I was like, I'm literally done. <laughs> it's literally a matter of minutes. <laughs> Okay, no, when you go back to edit this, can you count the number of times that that word was used? Well, you need like I, a ticker on the YouTube. I, yes. Picking, picking. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I haven't kept up. I, I, I think you just start from the beginning. I like that old South Park episode where they, how many times they could say the F word in an episode. Uh, yeah. That's hard, though. That's my favorite word. I think we all realize that. Sentence. <laughs> Sentence enhancers. You can use it anywhere. It's in any form. Yes. It's literally the greatest word ever. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get beat up too. So. Uh, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. I'm gonna windmill you. <laughs> okay, so working out. What? Oh, yes. I know exactly where I was gonna go. Okay. Interesting that you bring up the need to have mental health checks, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we do fitness for duty checks. We do mental health checks. So Senate Bill 53 includes a requirement that law enforcement officers in our state meet with a psychiatrist once every three to four years. Wow, every yeah. three to four years? Three to four years. Now, Well, nothing could at, possibly go <laughs> wrong in, in three, that to four three to four years. years. Um, I she was going to say months. I really did. The years kind of caught um, me off guard. I, I think it's too much to get us in and out. The scheduling nightmare would be. Yeah. There's I, well, I mean, and there's not rough. enough psychiatrists. No. I mean, that's, and the one that we do use is so overwhelmed. Yeah. Um, you would have to have a team. Um, but just the rotation, we can't even get calls for service answered now, let alone take an entire shift off to go Yeah. see the. Oh, you mean the whole defund the police and we're just going to send counselors out? That's well, not a great idea? Our agency has social workers, and they have been phenomenal. We started using co-responders to kind of deal with some of the contained situations, I guess. Mm-hmm. Right. And then just having the cops kind of kick back in the background. And, man, it, it really works well, that co-responder program and social worker yeah. program. Can they start transporting those people to the hospital? They actually, they will. Some, um, sometimes. That's a that's yeah, a depending. that's a liability I know, issue. I know it is. I don't have a problem taking anybody. I mean, yeah. <laughs> just saying, if you can take. I mean, the well, then what are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> they sleep. That's all they literally I got, do. I got twenty nine other runs. I can literally run all literally. Oh, that last one didn't work, but it counts. That's another one. Ticket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's funny you should mention that Senate Bill fifty three. The feds have had something in place. So I worked undercover for four years back in 2010 I think I was working with the FBI and they had this goofy rule is the Donnie Brasco rule basically and it was something like after the sixth buy before you can do your seventh buy from a bad guy or a group of bad guys you got to go get your head shrunk in DC so yeah so here I am completing six setting up seven and 
the guy in the suit calls and goes, hey, um, you got to stall. I'm like, why? We got this thing going. And he's like, we got to fly you out to D.C. to talk to uh, the psychologist, psychiatrist, psychologist, whatever. So they flew me out literally that night. <laughs> <laughs> Kiss my literal ass. <laughs> and um, put me up in a hotel, got a rental car, and then saw the shrink all day and then flew me back the next night. And then the next morning I was doing the drug buy. So that's a lot of money to yeah. spend. But that's I mean, a, we'd spent way more. Though too. Right. But I mean, they've had that in place since 2009 where it's like, if you have this many contacts with a bad guy, you're going to go see a shrink. I, I do think that their setup is really good. So they do a quarterly fit, um, fit challenge or whatever, where you literally have to run <laughs> push-ups and some setups. I think there's mm-hmm. a course that they have to run. And if you don't, then you're on light duty until you do complete it. But theirs is like every three to four months. So I'm not surprised that they would have that in place. That, that that's, I mean, there's no question to it. You either do it or you don't. Mm-hmm. And if you don't, then you're done. But it, but it makes sense. It's not hard to get caught up in that life. Yeah, and, and I wasn't like deep undercover by any means. I was doing, you know, truck buys from these these like hippie guys. It was kind of fun. We'd meet in Westport. <laughs> I'd have what? steaks. They'd be out sweating in the van, and I'd be on FBI that you dollars. To put a bunch of friends in a van, like hippies. Oh, I'm I'm and total hippie at heart. And, oh yeah, yeah. I can yeah. see it now. I don't think I do like ayahuasca or anything like that, but I'm down for drinking some beers and going on a road trip and not <laughs> cutting my hair. Well, I'm going surfing. Yeah. If I had a VW bus, that would be my dream. Well, they're out there. Mm-hmm. I know they're just expensive, and I don't know how to work on cars. So that one you can actually buy the book, though. Yeah, the climber manual. It tells you okay. everything. Really, they're, they're old cars. The older the now you talk me into it. Yeah, take my money. <laughs> <laughs> he just lost a jeeper. He's gonna sell his jeep and that's right. buy a real car. No, don't do that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna toy haul the jeep behind the VW bus, <laughs> rack it with a ton of surfboards. Okay, if you've never drove a VW bus, you're not hauling anything yeah. in that thing. Yeah, yeah. Top if you're not gonna like go that far. <laughs> yeah. Right. I think it had a four-cylinder engine. Well, maybe I'll put like a bigger engine in, right? Yeah. Put a V8 in it, see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Look like a cranked up bratwurst after you're done with it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was, I was referencing the Under Armour. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Bratwurst. Yeah. Everybody likes bratwurst. Sausage. Everybody likes sausage. Mm. Yeah. There's some vegans that don't. In one way, shape, or They're not real other. people, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I said that, and I'm not editing, editing no, it out we, either. No, there's many other avenues we could go on that one. But uh, so, how successful is the peer support um, program in the agency you worked? I know you're not there anymore, but yeah. still, I, you know, I I didn't necessarily agree with some of the things that went. I, I'm not a big fan of the. SISM debriefings. I just don't think it's awesome to sit everybody in a circle and trigger everybody at once. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of research that says that's that's not the best thing to do, especially yeah. with our population because it we get that, for lack of a better word, herd mentality. You get secondary where, trauma. Yeah, yeah, and just like giving a death notification, it's like it wasn't your loved one that passed, but you experienced that, and yeah. bringing a group of people that you're close with, and same thing. So, I. <laughs> I think it's successful in the fact that at least it's out there and people are looking out for one another. To be honest with you, I don't know because I'm not running it. So you really don't know who's um, seeking out help and who's not. Now, were you guys mandated to go um, after every incident to go see a psychiatrist? Uh, Depends on the incident. Okay. Uh, Most of the time not. But if you were having some issues, the department I worked for was, was pretty good about saying, hey, something's going on with this person. We're going to send them to, you know, the doc and go get them checked out. So, um, I think the administration actually did a good job trying to weed through that and, and say, Hey, you're going to go get some help whether you want it or not. Cause I know a lot of agencies are peer cities, um, mandate. But as soon as the incident's done, you get to call someone or if someone in the peer support group comes with you to the hospital. You do, a urine drop, and then you go see the psychiatrist the next morning. If it's uh, if it's like a, like a shooting, yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's typically what car crashes, things like that. Yeah, yeah. 
I think we need, I think our agency needs to be involved in that. But we've got too many hands in the I think the acute traumas are one thing, but um, something that we've really tried to address with the nonprofit as well is the cumulative stuff. You know? What do you mean by that? So the, if you can think back the last time you had a hard workout, not you, uh, or, <laughs> uh, did something that, that gave you a lot of pleasure and just that kind of that true decompression to where you just feel good. Um, I don't, I think at some point we lose that when we build the stress up and I, I work in the world of analogies in my mind, but if you just keep pouring crap into your bucket and bucket, it's going to eventually overflow and you need a mechanism to dump as long that. As you're saying of, you can only run at 11 for so long before you yeah. crash. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you need a mechanism and a positive outlet. So what we do is we grab the firefighter, veteran cop, and we drag them to the beach and we pay for everything and God, it, it naturally terrible, just, it? just ha- well, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I want to go. Because if you go, hey, let's go on vacation, they're like, crap, I got to get permission. I got to, yeah. I got to, you know, ring up credit card bills. I mean, each one of our trips is about seven grand to, to take people out and we do it right. Uh, but if you go, hey, I'm taking you and I've already got your wife's or husband's permission to do this, um, you know, they get to come back refreshed and then they go, oh, that's what that feels like to be, to have some reinvigoration, mm-hmm. some decompression, you know, and, and I had a period where I could just clear my head. Now I can come back fresh. Just like, you know, when you come back from, I don't know, good vacation, but this one doesn't incur any debt. Right. Well, the stress of it, right? So you don't have to worry about making sure that bills are paid yeah. or that off duty is taken care of or the dogs are kenneled or you know, so-and-so is going to school, you can just go because it's, you're being told to go. And we're terrible at recognizing like the cumulative. We can say acute, like, you know, Jeremy is involved in this incident. He's jacked up because of it. I can see that. But the slow building, mm-hmm. um, after Katrina, we worked, I worked 48 days straight at 16 hour shifts and I, I was fine. Although I was drinking half a bottle of tequila and run around with like, you know, different people every night. Uh, that's not a healthy way to live. And eventually what? that came up. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it was kind of fun at times, but no. So it, it and I just didn't, I didn't realize it. And We're I didn't. You're the squad. The, yeah. the squad, man. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like yeah. you got a bunch of firemen that were down there. Right. <laughs> Funny, I didn't see any of them. Uh, they were, they were they still were working. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so I, we're just terrible at recognizing it. And then we're terrible at telling people like, hey, you need to chill out. Uh, and then when we do, they don't even really listen. So you talked about working overtime or off duty and how many cops, firefighters, you know, that that's their life. Oh, absolutely. And then before you know it, yeah. the marriage is falling apart. Mm-hmm. The kids resent them. Uh, so anyway, what we're really trying to do, our main goal is just to to provide them that experience because we can't take them surfing every week, but we can say, Hey, this is what it feels like to really disconnect. Maybe you ought to find your own mode of decompression. Yeah. So when you and I were um, talking the other night, one of the things over that, wobbly chicken, over the wobbly chicken that was not near for a wings. meal. That was oh, just you, quite those are chicken nuggets. Mm-hmm. Wobbly chicken. Don't church them up. Chicken <laughs> nuggets, all right? Actually, they were wings, boneless wings, but chicken you know, nuggets. Chicken nuggets. Whatever. It's what it is. Wow. He seems a little angry over that. Yeah. Tenders? You're talking to a fat guy. Tips. T- 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 tell me it's a boneless wing. Tenders? It is a no. bone. <laughs> no. Shame on all of you. Oh my goodness. I have never seen the side of him. Wobbly chicken. It's food. This You're talking about problem. food. Yeah. I don't know why he's yelling. I, d- Dang. Food hungry. is my passion. <laughs> I like to eat it. get this man a Snickers. <laughs> it's my favorite candy bar, too. He's turning into Rosie and Barr over here. <laughs> Easy. Sam Kinison's coming. <laughs> so when we were talking over wobbly chicken. Um, yeah. Those boneless wings were fabulous. Mm, literally the best boneless wings I've ever had. Literally chicken. Nuggets, <laughs> literally. <laughs> so we were talking about um, that transition from uh, working. Now, your situation was a little bit different, but just for the normal um, cop that they hit their time and go into retirement, that first couple of weeks after going 90 to nothing, 
four on, four off, 10 hour shifts, off duty to, hey, thanks for your service. There's the door. Yeah. We'll see you when we see you. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that we need to do a better job of recognizing. Um, and I didn't realize it was there either. So I'm just as guilty as anybody sure. else that's active. Um, when that separation hits, there's a couple of things that happen. First of all, your routine's all jacked. And if you don't have something lined up, you're going to be lost. Um, if you don't have something to focus on, luckily, uh, I had a few things to focus on, but, um, some of the stuff that you haven't considered or even thought about in a very long time will come back to roost. And, um, <clears throat> you know, you'll, some of the, some of the things that I, I'll give you an example. When, when I was in FTO in Mississippi in 2003, uh, we ran a, a SIDS call, which sucks. And I was made to hold a baby and take pictures. Um, and I didn't even thought about that in, in years. And at the time I didn't think it affected me, but all of a sudden that, like when everything was quiet, we'd just be like, guess what, guess what, guess what, guess what? And it won't stop. And so I don't think that we prepare our people going into retirement well enough. And, and hopefully, you know, nobody else will ever experience that. But as we know, that's sure. not the, it's not the case. Right. Yeah. Those that's demons not reality. Come back. Yeah. And, and that separation, it's important to have, uh, something in place, some sort of outlet or, uh, plan for what you're going to do day one and kicking back for a month and doing nothing is typically our answer. And it's yeah. not a healthy one. I, yeah. that's, that's what we're seeing now. I, I have several friends about to retire yeah. and they say, yeah, it's just five months of kicking back and relaxing. And it's like, uh, my friend, mm. you have got to have a better s structure than that to land on. You're, you're going to need a plant. And yeah. it doesn't have to be sack and groceries no, at no. whatever, but go, go Good travel. Energy. You're going to see X, Y, yeah. and Z. You're going to jump in your VW bus, haul your <laughs> Jeep at 32 miles an hour. <laughs> You're going to see the half of the United States in a month. Um, you mentioned that in the You're call that have the state <laughs> <laughs> depends on which way the wind's blowing in the state that, uh, or in the agency, in the call that you had, um, a reoccurrence, a flashback, um, when you mentioned that you had to hold the child and take pictures, you didn't mean that that was like for fun. That was for evidentiary purposes yeah. so that it, because it was the death of a child. We have to take those photographs. So right. That, and the baby was wrapped. So yeah. the reason I had to hold the baby is I had to unwrap the baby and then yeah. take the pictures. And yeah, thank you for clarifying that. I just wanted to make sure you, it wasn't like some sick joke that no <laughs> it's like a no. hazing situation yeah. we, i don't think anybody are. thought that but maybe somebody watching could have so never know. yeah thank, thank you. you for clarifying but to kind of go back to your you know what we were talking about with the retirement thing i think you know obviously yes you have to have a plan but if you've taken care of your mental health along the way then maybe that transition isn't so jarring yeah 100 you know? percent. yep so that's something that we need to educate people on as well as, Hey, this is looming. You got to deal with all this crap. Well, and I've said for quite some time, we don't do ourselves a service at all. When it comes to retirement, that five, six, seven, ten 10 years out from retirement, whether it's mandatory or, or whatever, we need to be putting on classes for our own members on how to prepare yourself to be not a cop anymore. Military does a pretty good job. I think, I mean, I wasn't, I don't know. They, they, yeah. they help with, I mean, it may just be all for show. I don't know. Yeah. So, but my understanding is they have some sort of transitional classes and, and things to kind of help them come out of the service. Yeah. I think, I don't know. i we kind of talked about, I watched, was watching Jocko and, you know, I watch a couple other former military guys, um, that do podcasts and it's kind of, it seems like hit and miss with them and, you know, again, I'm just talking about what I've seen, Yeah. but some guys will say, uh, yeah, whenever I got out, it was like a week long class and I went to one day of it and it was crap. And then other guys are like, yeah, it prepared me great. And so I think it's, I think it's it depends what on what, it, yeah. And you. what branch you're getting out of. Sure. Yeah. So, that's yeah. I, I'd agree with that. There's some that I've heard similar stories and there's others like, yeah, they enrolled me in a master's program. That's now paid for. They taught me how to use a GI bill and yeah. go to this tech school. And then there's others. It well, was for like, us, it'd be like how to do a resume because so many of us law enforcement, mm -hmm. 
we retire and go be a security guard somewhere. Come on, 30 years of service as a cop and you're going to be, which I don't want to knock anybody who's, that's their chosen line of work. But is it really your chosen line or what you feel like that's all you're What's good at? What's yeah. That's our whoopee. Well, let's get you a resume. Let's get you in some classes. Let's get you prepared for the next step if yeah. it's another position. You know, I've, I've talked about it before of growth. And that's not something that's really talked about is even with, you know, we talk about post-traumatic stress and PTSD. We never talk about post-traumatic growth, but it's, it goes along with that same principle of if you have to get out of your comfort zone in order to grow. And if you are just comfortable with the status quo and how you are now, then you're going to be stuck in that same rut. You have to continue to grow and change and evolve. That's what life is. If you stay in the same spot, you're going to get the same results. Well, we have that. And it, I think not just in our professions, but we see it a lot in our professions. I've got a lot of people that I work with, even myself, 16 years in research and development. That's a long time to write policies and procedures as a cop, but I'm learning along the way, and I'm looking at, okay, this provides me a position where I can go do A, B, C, and D. Mm-hmm. Um but we've got people who sit in positions for 20 years because why not? Yeah. You're, you're just, you're stagnant. Right? It's really yeah. easy to feel when you separate that you're going to be physically broken. If you're, if you've done either of our yeah. jobs for 20 plus years, you're going to be broken. And then mm-hmm. chances are you're probably emotionally broken too. If you haven't taken care of both of those things, you are set up for failure and yeah. alcohol abuse and divorce and, uh, yep. you know, really putting the hurt into yourself. So, uh, I think that's a great idea is to have some sort of mechanism in place, whether we model the military or not, you know, <laughs> but, <laughs> well, but it's parts. a place to yeah. start. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no, no point in reinventing the wheel. If the wheel's already been invented, we just take it and, and bastardize it, make it our own. No. Um, you mentioned being broken um, afterwards, and I think that's also part of it. You know, we talk about old calls that come up in our minds that we can't really control that maybe we dealt with, didn't deal with, you know, injuries, back pains, knees, we're, you know, we are hard on our bodies and as first responders so that after police or fire department job needs to be something that we're physically and mentally ready for. How did you go from, how did you prepare yourself for that next step? Um, I don't I know, know that I did a great a job. Yeah. So I was in good physical condition considering uh, my injury. Um, so that helped. Um, mentally, I was unprepared for what was going on. And, you know, I had an interesting case where um, a doctor that the city had sent me to says, you can't do this anymore. And then the state said, well, I don't think you're injured enough. So it was, I battled with, well, people think I'm like making this up. And right. there was a long, there was a five month period where I would walk to the mailbox with like knots in my gut waiting to get the letter from the state and a thing that's supposed to take six to eight weeks took five months to deny. And then mm-hmm. a couple more months to finally approve, uh, which is the good news. So, um, you know, there were, there was a point there about midway through uh, that I was having some of these intrusive thoughts, and I I just knew that I had to get help, and it was from you know my exposure to the peer support program. So I reached out and went and saw somebody. We did some EMDR stuff, and um, some people say that works for them. Some people say it it doesn't. It's worked for me twice now with some intrusive thoughts I had, uh, traumas from Katrina, and uh, then with the separation and dealing with some of the those old calls coming back to haunt me. So, yeah. You we, mentioned EMDR. What is EMDR? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, we love our acronyms. Can somebody Google it? Uh, <laughs> it's yeah. I'm not on camera. I got it's this. Eye, yeah. It's eye, eye movement, movement desensitization something. I don't remember what the. We'll R get it here is. in a second. But yeah. it, essentially, what it does is the practitioner will put you into a place to where you're considering. Go ahead. What is the it? Eye movement desensitization. Sound it oh. out. Sound it Decent out. I know the fire department yeah. didn't have to read. I don't. I don't read. Hook <laughs> <laughs> it up, phonics. I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> Desensitis. 
I can't do it either. Yeah, desensitization. desensitization. Yes, wow. and reprocessing. There we go. Okay. So uh, the the practitioner will <laughs> will bring you through or back EMDR. to EMDR. There you go. EMDR. That's why we just said that. <laughs> the practitioner will bring you kind of back to the the point in time that you're thinking about, and um, they'll use some sort of stimulation, whether that's um, something for you to visually look at or something for you to feel. Uh, sometimes they'll just tap your knee. There's also uh, rods that you hold that, that'll vibrate back and forth at different speeds. And they'll talk to you about the incident. They'll stop and they'll say, okay, what was your feeling reaction or uh, relationship with that call? And you'll say, well, I felt helpless because here I am uh, holding a baby that's deceased. And there's nothing I can do. I felt like a piece of crap because of it. And like, okay, well, what's the reality of that? Could you have helped that baby? And it's like, no, the baby passed away long before we even got the call. There's nothing I could have done about that. And SIDS happens. So they go, okay, we'll think about that. And then they run the, um, the, whatever the stimulus is by you. Again, you process, you reprocess the event and mm-hmm. you actually are forced to look at it like a reasonable human being, not like Superman, Superwoman, right. as we tend to do. Mm-hmm. So that worked for me a couple of times. So if you've got something that you're struggling with, I would suggest giving it a shot. Yeah. And it, and it doesn't have I've to be wonder, a month long. It'd be two sessions EMDR. and be done with it. Yeah. And it, that's the great thing about EMDR is it has the potential to work very rapidly for people. One session, two sessions, you know, which is not always the case. And we've talked about that multiple times. You know, everybody's different. So what type of therapy may work for you may not work for her, may not work for me, but what works for me might not work for you. And what's important is to keep trying to keep going through right. different therapy modalities until you find the one that works. It's where you get into the problem is where you just throw your hands up and go, well, nothing works. I'm just broken. I'm special. Yeah. Well, Don't you're not. <laughs> There's a way. So I'm wondering if EMDR could be used more of after a critical incident to help prevent it from getting to the point to where you're retired. Well, I'm- so... I'm going to jump in on this one. Um, I think it could be the, the thing with critical incident. I don't know if you guys have the uh, CISD with your department or if you had critical incident stress debrief. Yeah. The SISM stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So whenever you're doing that kind of processing immediately afterwards, it should work and it should prevent you from, continuing down because as we know post-traumatic stress is totally normal right everybody gets it 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 just happens that's what it is where it becomes a problem is whenever it's allowed to continue and become ptsd so as we talked about earlier though that group sitting in a group for our jobs or communities is not necessarily the greatest thing the research has shown being one-on-one allows us to open up more because whenever we're in a group, we tend to get that. We still have that alpha mentality and nobody wants to open up and be vulnerable. Now you don't want to show any emotion because you don't want them knowing that you can't handle your own shit. Right now. Not all groups are like that. Not all departments are like that. Some of them are very open. They're very progressive and it works for them by and large though. However, it doesn't. So, yeah, and I think you can trigger one another too. Because I, I remember we ran a gosh, such a bummer talking about kids. But anyway, I'm yeah, sorry. Kids uh, are the way that I mean that'll get you every time. Yeah. So we ran one of the. I don't know. You can talk about the incident. But we ran one of those, and we had a debriefing at the fire department with fire and medic. And uh, there's a uh, medic gal there, and um, she's awesome. And I had a lot of respect. Have a lot of respect for her, and, and really liked her. And she was like torn up rightfully so and pissed and um it made me even more pissed and more torn up and i felt like um i probably just need a little bit of time to process and then work it out with somebody one-on-one but being in that group setting i felt her pain because i had that bond with her and it made mine worse yeah so that's my issue with that and i think what you're discussing about emdr prior to retirement it's kind of like fishing around for cancer, (laughs) you know what I mean? (laughs) Before like has, but I think, I think what's this, uh, critical instance stress management or debriefing tries to 
do or accomplish is to get that outcome in a po- not positive, but a reasonable right. state prior to, so it doesn't develop into right. PTSD. Right. So uh, I think that's important. I just don't know how to accomplish that right. unless it's a one-on-one deal or some people want to get in a group, but I think making it mandatory is silly. Like, but you I know, think that's the only way you're going to be able to get people to buy into it. Well, I think it's a, a, it's a culture shift that yeah. has to happen. You have to have people that or make it okay and encourage people to want to do that kind of stuff, yeah. to take it seriously, to realize how important it is. And then you don't have to mandate it. It's just something that organically naturally happens. The, the younger generation is really doing well with that. They are. And, put, and pushing for it and wanting it and going to it and using it. And it's kind of trickling up. Our younger generation is more work-life balanced. Yeah. They're more, I will work but it cannot mess with my balance at home. Yeah. Um, and I think that influence, especially after the pandemic now, is going to change things with families being working at home. They're seeing all the mm-hmm. things that they've missed out on. Um, now, Cops Fire, we really didn't get a chance to do that. Um, thank God I didn't have to teach my children <laughs> school <laughs> because it would have been bad. Um, Are you one of those people that can't do math? No, I math is actually one of my strong things. I it's, can't math good. You can't math good. Mm-hmm. I, I can't <laughs> with the patience. Um, there was a, t- a TikTok that said, "I can't believe these people who cuss around their kids." And I'm like, <laughs> I cuss at my children so that they can never be <laughs> triggered by anything anybody says. They now will never flinch. So, um, I, I cuss at my son. He turned 19 yesterday, so. <laughs> oh, age, I don't think age has anything to do with it. I did. He was a kid. See, I, I'm just part of my part of Congratulations on 19. I, know, I can't believe you made it. <laughs> <laughs> he's just like his dad. <laughs> so he's an eater. Did you guys go out to eat? No, he's tall and skinny. I worked overtime yesterday because he already told us he didn't do anything for his birthday. Well, I think that's something else. I'm going to use that as a pivot point. Pivot to um part of retirement is that you're so used to being able to pick up a job or two mm-hmm. as law enforcement and fire department and just to pay for whatever all the toys and stuff and you live start living above your means like you said and then all of a sudden now you're retired and now what yeah you're on a fixed income yeah you're on a fixed income pension or 401k or yeah being prepared for that's important and i know i Again, I don't know about your departments, but ours was good about um, putting us in a good position to be successful, having classes. The um, I'm not a huge Ramsey person. Is it Ramsey? Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey. But they purchased like the classes for anybody that wanted to attend for several months. And you could just go do Dave Ramsey on the department. And a lot of people did, and they got their, their crap in one sock and – um, again, fortunate. That's not the the norm. I think most people are like good luck, and then you know they take the lump sum and blow it on right. jeeps and VWs. <laughs> so necessities, so right? Necessities. Stuff you need to travel the country. Yeah. Our credit of. union does does a good job with that. They've got several financial classes um, for that, so I think that's fantastic. I was just, I was just inhaling. Sorry, oh, I was like. I didn't know. Were you trying to <laughs> were you trying to suck the dough? Yeah, I'll just pass. I'll just pass them on. You, I like that. Whenever shot. you slam him like that, you got to make sure that you're talking into the mic, though. I can, I can taste it. I'm not. I'm not a Duncan fan, though. I like the mom and pop shops. Don't don't let him fool you. It's donuts. He's not He'll gonna, eat he's not gonna turn yeah. one away. As soon as not. as soon as that camera goes off, I those will be gone. Is, like, is there a long john in there? <laughs> <laughs> is it a chocolate long john? See, we had a big over? conversation. <laughs> He's like, oh, you're going to pay. <laughs> I'm going to go on Homer Simpson on those here in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> we had a conversation the other night about acceptable donuts to bring. And we agreed Donut King. Donut King, yeah. Yes. I just ran out of time this yeah. morning. You know, I like raised donuts, too. Um, Still homemade. Well, and there's yeah. one. There's uh, one in Liberty. And one in North Kansas City that's a mom and pop shop mm-hmm. that's really mm-hmm. good. Sorry, yeah. guys. I, yeah. I actually have a life. Kids and <laughs> actually, so my son, I got to have my son now that, you know, we're divorced. So we 
we trade off every week and Wednesday's the week that we trade off. So he came over late last night, you know, being 16, I <laughs> actually got to see him. So this morning he had to go to football practice at six thirty, And I'm like, dude, you need to be up. You need to be up. You need to be up. You need to eat. You need to eat. And he's like, six twenty. Well, and it, my stress is up here. I'm like, oh, you're not going to make it. So I was a little late getting things rolling this morning. So. You, you know hey, how to remedy that, Dana, right? thanks for bringing donuts. You're welcome, Rob. I appreciate that. <laughs> I got beer in the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, so you know what tomorrow night is for this guy over here? That's yeah, my retirement party. And you guys are all invited. Oh. It's down at, at War, War Horse. Cool. Yeah. Come pet some ponies and empty out their fridges. <laughs> Guess who's calling us sick tomorrow? <laughs> I can't say that on the I guess the recording well, won't happen yeah. for a couple of weeks. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter. <laughs> this will be on in two weeks. So, uh, yeah. Food poisoning from the Duncan. Yeah. I, I don't think anybody. That's pretty in, typical for Duncan Donuts, though. I don't think anybody in management watches this you podcast. Never so. You never know what can Well, now they do. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> of course, this will be the episode they watch. Yeah. You never know what what will influence someone. That is very Which true. Which is why I'm thankful you have this rolling. This is good stuff. Yeah. Well, you know, like, and I've talked about it with several people. If I can, if through the process of doing this and telling, sharing people's stories, sharing resources and all of that, if we can keep one person from going down the path that I went down, that's a win for me. But here's the thing. Um, Into so the mic. My philosophy is completely... <laughs> She's been doing good I all know, episode. I try really hard. Just <laughs> get squirrely. <laughs> <laughs> I watched her grip it. I do <laughs> not. I'm not editing this. I'm telling you right now. Do not go down this path. I'm trying to take the detour. Don't take the off air. Don't do it. <laughs> I told you I was going to Miranda this shit. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so my philosophy on life is to never have regrets. It's an emotional waste of time. Right. If you hadn't have been where you were, your path would not be where you're at right now. Um, people say, oh, I, I wish I would have seen the signs and I should never have gotten married. Well, you know what? If I had never gotten married, I wouldn't have the two wonderful children Wonderful when they're on time in the morning. Bucket of cold water and makes them on time. <laughs> when he's almost six foot two, it's more like throwing. Well, up, if he's laying in bed asleep, it's an easy dump. <laughs> we're working on it. Um, you wouldn't have met the people that you have met, and you don't know the impact that you've had on those people already to this point. So. I really try to push that people should just never regret things in the past. I mean, sure, we could have done things differently, um, but we wouldn't be here, wouldn't be the people that we are if we didn't do it. So, right, live without regret. Wise words. Yeah, I think so. But still, like I, I can't said, believe she said it. Why? With every fat joke she's made. And now she doesn't regret any of those fat jokes. I don't regret <laughs> anything I say. <laughs> it's okay. I literally Some want people... a donut right now. Oh, I'm back Aww. with the literally. <laughs> it's like it's like pong, <laughs> pong. Um. I have anything else? Well, yeah. So, in the course of our conversation yesterday, you did mention um, taking kids. With swell, yeah. so is that at risk youth, or I mean, what are what are we talking about? There? So, um, that, thank you for bringing that up because it's something I'm really passionate about, and uh, I've been fortunate, and we've been fortunate enough to partner with several really great organizations, and one of those is the Kansas City Kansas Police Athletic League, and what they do is their mission is to really mentor and, and guide uh, the youth that are at risk or inner city, or you know, and just in the city, really. Um, and they do a lot of cool stuff. They've got a boxing gym. They do homework with them. They do gardening, all sorts of stuff, uh, art, archery. Uh, but mostly what they're there to do is just kind of connect and build bridges. So 
um, I volunteered at the Police Athletic League and helped with their boxing and their fitness program with the kids uh, prior to even starting Swell. So they've always been on my radar. And with kind of where we're at as a nation uh, with police and um, at-risk communities and underserved communities, uh, everybody's angry and, um, you know, both sides are shouting and, and pointing fingers and, and you know, to a certain degree, I think there's, yeah, people have the right to be angry and they have questions. Um, what I thought to myself, very much like the 9-11 issue is, well, what are you going to do about this? Mm-hmm. And I don't know a lot of stuff, but I know how to take people surfing. So I got with the pal and uh, we put our heads together and we said, okay, let's identify six kids that are committed to the program. And then we're going to take them and we're going to teach them how to swim and we're going to prepare them. And then if they continue through this path of the next couple of months, uh, we're going to take them out to Huntington Beach, California, along with some current and former police officers, and we're going to teach them how to surf together. And our trips, um, not only are we surfing, but we also do yoga meditation. Uh, we do family-style meals. So we've got two different... You're familiar with that. Family-style right? meals, yeah. You want to go? Damn right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so I like to surf, though, right? <laughs> no, you got to surf. Why wouldn't you? That's right. You see the penguin movie, man? The, the fat <laughs> penguins surf. <laughs> I'll push you in a couple knee breakers. It'll be fine. My, my only problem is going underwater. I, if I go, into, no, if I go into water, I get automatic ear. You're like a turd. You'll I float. Have, we'll get you. <laughs> I have holes in my eardrums. No. You'll I, float. We'll put we'll put the wax stuff in. Yeah. <laughs> All I heard was vacation to California and food. Yeah. So I, I think that, you know, having these two communities out there, uh, learning a new skill together, everybody's on the same level playing field, and uh, nothing like the great equalizer of Mother Ocean to kind of humble everybody. The hope is that there's some lasting bonds that are built, but not only that, but a little bit of trust. So maybe the inner city youth that we've brought may see a cop on the street. Maybe it's not the cop that they went surfing with, but they'll see something in that cop that they recognize through the other one and maybe see him as a person. And then vice versa, the inner city cop that we bring that surfed with the youth, maybe they won't see that same youth on the street, but they'll be able to relate a little bit better and say, you know what? I know the circumstances some of these kids come from, and it's there's some stories, Dire man. Situations. Um, so yeah, it's it's one of those deals where it's like it's a little thing that I can do to influence that we can do. I want to make sure that I give enough credit to the pal because they've really been a huge part of this. Um, but it's something that we can do to influence uh, outcomes in our community, and it's a small bridge that we can build. And I think if more people would stand up and say, "This is the one thing that I can do to help heal," then maybe we can get back to just a sense of reasonableness and have actual conversations and not just sit there and throw piss bottles at one another. Well, yeah. And that's huge is building those bridges. And ultimately I think both sides need to see, okay, they're people, we're people. Yeah. You know, I feel like people need to get rid of the hate, you know, stuff that's happened in the past. I can't, I can apologize all day long for how someone's been treated. I, that's like me holding things against other people. I don't know what led you here to this point that I've now met you, but from this moment on is how I'm going to treat you like a human being and we're going to move together. Or we can continue to be divided. I mean, if you want to be divided and that feeds your desire for life, whatever. Um, but it's not a healthy place to, to be. And eventually we're going to have to come together to be a community. Yeah. I think the fa- it's a fantastic program. It sounds like a, something really important to both law enforcement and those kids too because they'll not just see the cop they'll see the person behind the badge and i give a lot of credit to the you know the pal because they've these right. parents are giving them their children to the pal to take to california right. into the ocean <laughs> and they're barely learning how to swim now so think of the just the credibility that they've built over the years with these parents to where they're going to allow this to take place. It's just, it's amazing. I think, you know, I know that Kansas city also has a pal and uh, the more programs that we can do to have interactions on a positive note outside of, of call for service, the, the better. So I applaud, you know, them for that. And I'm really, really pleased to be able to be a small part of it. Well, I Absolutely. think police athletic leagues are nationwide I, I don't think it's just our two states right they are it's yeah just like nationally yeah it's a national them. deal I think mm-hmm. it's a, a fantastic it's international program. actually I think there's one in I can't remember when they said there was one overseas like the Netherlands or something like that so 
They have the cops in the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they wear wooden shoes and go. Foot <laughs> <laughs> <"What> pursuit. <laughs> Right? No? Can we not make fun of that? We can make fun of Dutch people, right? Yes. Is that okay? Yeah, right. that's fine. I don't think we've reached across the pond yet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just not yet. That was the, great. The, yeah. I don't know, we, we, maybe we'll get a comment from some bobbies or something. I don't know. <laughs> it's funny. That's, so we're actually going funny. to the UK this September. UK. Going UK. Yeah. With them, so. I mean, you might have to pull up a map. I think I UK Bobby's and Netherlands are a little bit different. Whatever. <laughs> Take the They're job. all the same, apparently. Take the it doesn't job. really matter. Oh, so yeah, I think that is a, a fantastic program. Yeah, and I like I it hope, a lot too. I think it's awesome. Yeah, I hope you're able to expand on that. Yeah, I mean, our mission is really uh, veterans first responders, but I, I would hope that, you know, in the future we can do this on an annual basis with, with the PAL. It's a huge commitment on their end. Yeah. Um, as you can imagine, the logistics behind it. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty significant. I mean, we've got three beach houses now and uh, Huntington beach and they're, they're flying a chef out. And I mean, they're, these kids are going to have a great time and I'm just, again, super ecstatic to be a part of it. Well, and what a great situation for the underprivileged youth to be able to get outside of Kansas city or get outside of their home and just experience yeah. another environment, There's right? Another scenery, different. Oh, yeah. jump on the beds, not have to worry about where their next meal's coming and, so, see, and things see like part that. part of the country they've only seen pictures of. Right. Or, you know, never experienced it. And that's, the ocean alone. Yeah. That's gonna, like, the ocean's amazing yeah. by itself. And then, right. you, you know, you got beach houses. That's something most of us have never experienced. You know, a chef cooking for you. There's something to be said about that. Well, you're that married. She is, a, she is a chef. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Don't let him fool you. <laughs> His wife does everything. Yeah, no, I can tell. He eats well. Mm-hmm. And I sit on the couch and watch TV and play video games. <laughs> <laughs> Suck yeah. at everybody else. <laughs> okay, so how can we help or support the swell? So there's a couple of different ways. I mean, honestly, I, I would just like the the veterans and, and first responders and, and your communities to just be aware of what we're doing. Um, spread you know, the message. Spread the message and and with the message eventually funding will come. We've got a lot of fundraisers that we do, uh, to make these happen. Like I said, each trip's about $7,000. Uh, we don't take a dime for any of our staff. I spend about 20 to 30 hours a week, uh, on the program. Uh, we've got clothing line. You can go on and buy a hat, buy a t-shirt. They're not expensive. Um, you, you can buy some coffee. Bottles. What's you that? You need water bottles. I know we're working on it. We're actually transitioning into a, a different, uh, platform to where we'll be able to actually sell stuff like that. So uh, we sell our own coffee, uh, partner with Wind and Sea Coffee out of S- San Diego, Bravo Zulu Brew, and we get our proceeds from that. And yeah, monetary donations are, are helpful as well. But mostly for for those listening that are in or watching in our communities, just just know that it's out there because eventually I think our departments need to embrace some of these programs that are out there and maybe even financially support some of these. Um, things that are going on because I think it could be beneficial. Yeah. I know it's right. beneficial. I collect so statistics I know on that it. So. Yeah. My department has a resource list for um, members to reach out to. So I will work on today getting that you guys added to it, um, which I think would be beneficial. I don't know about the funding. So many of our agencies are so hurt for money. Uh, yeah. I mean, we're really now. hurt. Yeah, right. Yeah. 20% yeah. fund. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, with that funding brings another issue because now we're, you know, not to demean what you're talking about, but um, not knowing what's going to happen with a budget screws with a lot of cops' heads right mm-hmm. now, and they're already running call to call to call. Uh, it's yeah. we've got people who have two, three years on that came on when everybody idolized police officers, and now all of a sudden they hate them. They don't know how to react to it. They don't know if this is the job that they want to do anymore. So it's the future of law enforcement is we're hurting. We're hurting bad. Yeah, it's extremely unstable. We don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's scary. You pull the, fun, the funding right out underneath you. I mean, you can keep telling me we're going to be okay, we're going to be okay. But if, you know, with retirement, you need to have a plan. But you always need to have a plan. You know, we were all looking for a job. You guys were looking to be cops. But... Uh, <laughs> became fire department but you know we were all looking for a job and got lucky uh-huh. to do our dream my dream job um 
it's that next step. What's next? And their dream job too. Yeah, absolutely. You doing their dream job yeah. is what I was saying. I know. <laughs> wow. It's really cool. <laughs> it is really cool. Maybe someday they can come on a ride along. <laughs> Let, let me know. I'll, I'll let you borrow a vest. <laughs> they won't well, I mean, take care you make a good point with, you know, the two to three year cops. And now think about the ripple it's going to cause. Who who are we hiring right now? Like what what person, God bless them, wants to be a cop right now? I mean, you got to take that's somebody a good that's thing, extremely. Though. If they're coming on right now, they're willing to do the dirty work, the hard work. This is what if this is the worst that they ever see things. Totally agree. But what about what about departments that are maybe making some exceptions that they Abs- normally would? It's yeah, lowering the standards because yeah. they need bodies. Yeah, and I'm not suggesting and that, that anybody we know is doing that, but uh, I think it probably it's something you still got to think about. It's yeah. a reality. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, and you know with marijuana and and the drug issue and hiring and opioids and all kinds of stuff that are affecting the hiring standards anymore it's social media is a huge i just wish these kids would stop with the social media because it really knocks them out of the Mm -hmm. out of but that's that's our culture now it it really is is you know everybody's on TikTok and Facebook. Speaking and of, have you guys seen our Facebook video that went viral? I'll have to look it up. Mm-hmm. No, I'm not on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't have a personal it's a one. Shame. So. It's a shame. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's a whole part of our culture now. And what these kids that are growing up now are seeing is, okay, I can go do this video, it can go viral, and I can be famous. Right. If they don't put any forethought into okay how is this going to affect me later on in my life whenever i'm trying to go get a job or i've been trying to teach my son that since he was 14 or 13 um mr money off of um shark tank has um several videos uh, specifically for that that are worth letting them watch because it talks exactly about what what people in his position or any position of hiring look for and what they will disqualify for and how deep just because you delete it today doesn't mean that it's gone yeah so yeah. oh no if it no, gets posted I mean, it's uh, it's out there well not only that but so we, they do that during the pre mm-hmm. now they get on and now we're snapchatting and video live driving 100 miles an hour down you know one of our main streets that's a city street a resident residential street mm-hmm that's live. Something happens. I, it just blows my mind that that's okay. It, well, it's not know. okay. It's well, just they think it's okay. okay. Anyways. So. Yeah. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> and eat your vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> and get up on time. And do your homework. <laughs> yeah. He, as my boy was mimicking me last night. He was like, like this is all I hear. <laughs> okay, I'll change that. That's all right. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming on. Rob, any closing thoughts? It's better to fight naked than to fight a naked man. <laughs> right. I, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. That was a good one. Thank that, you. Yeah. Yeah. I used to run right. roll calls and I would leave my people with some closing art. No, I, <laughs> I I just I appreciate what you're doing to to have conversations because I think that the more we can have these conversations, the more people step up and say, Hey, I had an issue and I went and got help and I'm I'm doing well now. Look at the stuff I'm able to to accomplish. I think more leaders and mentors do that, the better off we're gonna be. Normalizing it. Yeah. It's no different because it's normal. The it's there. It's it's there. Everybody has yeah. issues. Right. Yeah. Some have more than others. Right. <laughs> I control it with food. Go get your emotional. <laughs> <laughs> go get your emotional colonoscopy, everybody. <laughs> I like it. I like that one. Dana. I have nothing. Nothing. You guys are a blast. It's always it's always it's, good to see you guys. Yeah. It's always good for you to see us. Thanks for having Rob on too. Yeah. Glad oh, it all last worked out very Yeah. Well. I. Thanks for mm-hmm. allowing me to impose. Didn't no. impose at all. Thank you so much. I really didn't so have much. a choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let that be known. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. I think yeah. the work that you're doing is fantastic. Um, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Keep it up. 
I don't even know what to say about it. It's, I, I've just been blessed to have people help me along the way. I'm, I'm not a smart person. I just, I give a crap and I'm passionate about stuff, but I've just, other people have pulled me along this journey. So for that, I'm grateful. It's not because of me for sure. It's okay to be a leader. Even <laughs> yeah. if it's by accident, <laughs> yeah. it's okay. Take it and run with it. Okay. Yeah. Take the compliment. Thanks. Dad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I need to get punched I mean, in the face a second. Y'all are, <laughs> the lights are going to go down, and it's going to be like I we're Batman. Allowed to compliment and here. I feel like these are all backhanded. Wow. <laughs> wow. You're, you're just waiting for the setup. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. No, it's a kindler, gentler. Right. Yeah. No. Um, I appreciate you guys. Well, we appreciate you guys very much. Again, Rob, thanks for coming on. Like I said, work you're doing is fantastic. Um, Any way that we can help just let us know spread the word brother yeah they're one of those stickers on your jeep <laughs> yeah i if i can get it keep yes, it running right. then yeah <laughs> it's a jeep it's like broke down half the time yeah it's gonna get towed by vw it'll be fine, <laughs> it'll be fine. <laughs> all right i still see put the v8 and the vw yeah awesome. you know those are rear engines right yeah i know yeah okay it'll still be fun okay all right can you ever watch Fast the furious yes the original one yes you know, you know, you know you remember what I'm talking about? Where's no, the, the, uh, it's dead silent, so I would say no. Where they're, ra- where they're racing, uh-huh. he's in the, the uh, char- I think he's in the Charger. Mm-hmm. That's a Charger, and though. And he gives it the gas, and mm-hmm. he brings the, the front end off the oh, ground. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's going to be his, yeah. Yeah, except it's just going to set like that. No, he's going to jack it up. <laughs> he's got monster tires. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> he's my vision, my hype man. Yeah. I got, Stealing I got him you. from you. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a hard steal. Jeremy's going to be like, you can have him. You, you got a half a package of Twizzlers? You can have him right now. <laughs> Who likes Twizzlers? Those are disgusting. They're fat free. That's the point. Point was just proven. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for uh, stopping by. If you're having a problem or you know somebody that's having a problem, reach out. There are resources out there. Um, thanks. Take care of yourself. <laughs>